When you mention two words, Yao Ming, you automatically think of his impact on U.S.-China relations. He built an enormous bridge between two cultures and countries. As a member of the NBA's Houston Rockets, he thrilled fans around the globe. The son of professional basketball players, he managed to tower over his peers in a sport dominated by athletes of stature. At the time of his retirement, he was the tallest member of the NBA, standing in at seven foot six inches tall. But he has an extraordinary presence off the court as well. Yao Ming is a wild aid ambassador. Since 2006, he's been a warrior in the fight to save elephants and rhinos from the dire effects of poaching. He's also pushing for a ban on the sale of ivory. Poachers and politicians are tough opponents, and changing thousands of years of Chinese tradition is no easy task either. But Yao Ming has always been a fierce competitor, ready for even the stiffest of challenges. In his new documentary, Saving Africa's Giants with Yao Ming, he witnesses firsthand the devastating results of killing and maiming for ivory. Take a look. This is the place where we found Tandi, watching her go through this nightmare for something as meaningless as a horn. My heart just sank. She's nothing short of a miracle that she survived the poaching. And so, Yao, if you can help us take that message back to China. We share this war with all the living things. It was amazing that this man, who is so highly respected in his own community, is prepared to put his name to this crisis. Having the support of the Chinese media has been absolutely phenomenal. When the buying stops, the killing can too. We are going to name you the Nasakalai because we want you to be our elephant defender. Yao Ming joins us to talk about why conservation is so very important to him. His motto, when the buying stops, the killing stops. Welcome, Yao Ming. Hi, thank you. Um, the defender of the elephants, I mean, that's a pretty tall task, isn't it? Uh, yes, just like you mentioned earlier, it's, uh, it's not an easy task because it is true that so we have very deep uh, traditional uh, impact uh, about uh, collecting those uh, animal product there. Now, I, I read somewhere that Jackie Chan influenced you. Talk to me about his influence. Yes, um, in the early age of um, uh, Wild 8 mission, uh, we, we also involved uh, other animal products such as uh, tiger, tigers, uh, and also shark bin, uh, shark bin soup. Um, uh, 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 Jackie, Jackie Chan is uh, uh, involved with the tiger protection, so I watched some of his uh, PSA on TV, on the, on the TV channel. <clears throat> uh, you know, everybody know he's famous, you know, for, for people now and also uh, a gener generation like me, you know, he's a hero for us, he, he, you know, he, he brought us to here. And shark fin soup, uh, since you've gotten involved in that, uh, you've seen a dramatic drop, haven't you? Yeah, we, we had some, uh, we have a big success on that. Um, since we launched the campaign in 2006, uh, the demand and the price have dropped almost 50 percent, maybe more, and that shows great results and also give it a full confidence of moving forward into uh, ivory trade and also the uh, uh, rhino horn. Ivory trade is kind of, uh, well, ivory itself is sort of intertwined in the culture and the history of, of China. How do you get that cultural shift? I mean, how difficult is it to pull that off? Uh, you know, ivory represents uh, 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 wealthy and uh, powerful people uh, in history. I, I believe in not only in China, but some uh, certain other Asian cultures that have a, a similar, uh, similar impact. I think the people are starting to change their mind already, and we are at a very good timing to, to make this, you know, uh, make, make this uh, happen. Well, part of making that happen is this documentary, which is extraordinary. I watched it yesterday. It's just fantastic. It is, it's multi-layered. There's a lot to it, and we'll talk a lot about that. But, but I want to show a clip, but I want to warn our viewers, uh, some of this stuff's pretty tough to take. I mean, we've got some graphic imagery. But let's take a look at you on the ground in Africa, and we can talk a little bit more after this. This is a male, and looking at the teeth, it looks to me like it's probably about maybe 35 years old at the most, maybe younger. Looks like the entire, entire face got cut off. It did. So yeah, they would have come here with axes and just cut it out quickly as they could. And you know, when a gang becomes active, they just go for it. 
Mm. And if you sit up on the hills and you look where they move, and it's the full moon, I would say the main timing is when there's a moon. If they're spraying into a whole herd, they'll hit little ones, and the little ones will die as well as the big ones. It's always better every time we see it. This is the consequence of buying ivory. The consequences of buying ivory. Um, how, how many people do you think in China recognize or realize what's going on there on that continent? I, I think people know, but most of the people learn that from a paper, from a reporter. Uh, all those numbers and uh, you know how much money uh, spending on the uh, collect those ivories. Um, but uh, turn off uh, those images like we just show on the screen that uh, we'll get we'll, we'll reach to more people and I'll give them more deeper impact uh, to reach people's soul in there. Uh, have them to know that uh, it's, it, we cannot just stay on paper and tell you, you know, how many elephants have been killed because of ivory, but we have to act. And one of the things that I really like about the documentary is it shows the difficulty of getting to these herds. I mean, w w th these populations are getting wiped out, and I think a lot of people don't recognize just how dire this is. Yes. Um, uh, for the record, that, that's um, nearly 30,000, um, 33,000 uh, elephants being killed every year, per year. And if you, you can think of this, it's one elephant every 15 minutes. Mm. When we're talking, maybe there's a life lost already there in Africa. It's, that's how quick it is. And uh, with that number, the entire elephant will be wiped out in, uh, in, inside a decade. Jeez. Let's take another uh, look at another clip. This is, again, uh, just to warn viewers, some of this stuff is tough stuff, but this really kind of shows the horrors of this trade. Let's take a look. Because a gunshot draws attention, criminals are choosing to quietly tranquilize their victims and then hack the rhino's horns off while they're still alive. Watching her go through the horror of waking up into this nightmare, for something as meaningless as a horn, it was an absolutely heart-wrenching thing to, to witness. What was going through your mind when you were watching that and talking to him? Uh, it, is, uh, it is very suffering even for me. And I heard those story when, they, uh, when the poachers were when taking a horn down even when, when the animal was still alive. I mean, I, I can't do it. I, you know, I, I just feel that we, we, we lost our uh, humanity in there, and somehow. And uh, I, I was thinking if I, I, I buy some any of uh, animal product here in States or in China, whatever, they're equally to supporting a bullets for the poacher to go back in. What's the main thing you'd like to get across to viewers? Um, I, we just hope that have more people join us and realize the reality there. And we, we try to uh, stop people to, to buy the product. So, uh, so therefore, there's no reason for those poachers back to there, back to Africa. And uh, even we know that's that land maybe thousands of miles from, away from us. But, uh, and I think what I said in there, that we share this, this world with every living things here. We, we, we have to uh, do our, uh, we have to do our, do our job and uh, take care of our responsibility. Let's talk a little bit more about the Chinese tradition. We've got another clip. Let's, let's watch this, and I want to talk to you about this as well. An average rhino horn weighs about eight pounds. One horn alone is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. But it is also worth nothing, because rhino horn is simply keratin, the same as our fingernails. There is no proof that it can cure disease or illness, as rumors claim. Rhinos are being poached at an enormous rate to supply a medical delusion. But it is a big part of traditional Chinese medicine. How do you turn the corner there as well? I mean, he says it's a delusion, but there are a lot of people who believe in this. It's uh, some of what you can call this uh, superstitions uh, in, in there. It is even I believe believe it in what one was young. You know, I remember that we have some of our traditional medicine and tell people they have a rhino horns in there, but it make it into a powder. Uh, something in a rhino horn has already been officially banned in, in China by the government back to 19 late 80s. Um, but it's still, you know, 
a black market uh, illegal trade is still happening there. Um, so uh, we, we have to spread out a message, you know, friend to friend and uh, people to people, to have more people know that actually that uh, the rhino horn is, is a taking from a living thing and also that that is not like uh, the people said, it's really helpful for the, for, for, for the medicine. You've pushed the government for an outright ban on ivory. I think back in 2014, where has that gone with the Chinese government? Uh, illegal ivory trade already been banned in China, but it's still having some reserve from old age. And that, that's, the, that's a problem right there where people get, get confused what is uh, illegal trade or on the, on the other hand side is illegal, uh, legal trade. And sometimes there will be have a backdoor because you can replace the uh, items, so you can have, you can sell the two ivory, but only with uh, one license on there. Uh, I, I think making this clear is that uh, we can make a, this uh, send this clear message that any ivory trade is being banned in China. That people don't need to confuse, don't need to think about it. Just uh, if you see uh, uh, ivory on the market, you know that's illegal. That we should not going to do that. Uh, let's take a look at the Stop the Buying ad and we'll chat a little bit about that as well. You don't have to play ball to be a great shot blocker. Never buy illegal wildlife products, and we can save our endangered animals. When the buying stops, the killing can too. What more can people do other than just stopping the buying, do you think? Well, I think that's, this is the key for it. You know, I hope nobody, no one to buy it uh, from, from the day he, they, 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 uh, um, you know, people saw, saw, the, saw the video, saw the film. You know, that, that is our priority. I think that that can be that that can wipe out the entire uh, poacher chain from from the very beginning from the roots. I interviewed uh, Kristen Davis, the star of uh, Sex and the City, uh, not too long ago, and she talked about being in Africa, and there was an orphaned uh, baby elephant, and that they 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 saved that baby elephant, but it left such an imprint on her, and she's so active in this community, talking about the same issue that you are. And I was struck watching you in the video. There was one little baby elephant that came up to you and kind of followed you around. Um, you know, that bond. Uh, can you talk to us about that? Because most of us will never be in that situation like Kristen or yourself, but I don't think you can get back on a plane and head back home and not stop thinking about yeah. those little babies. Um, you know, I, I know there's people uh, collect, uh, you know, have pet at home, but I don't know about an elephant <laughs> at, at this size. And you know how, uh, and I, I think it's, very, it's amazing. One day that some baby elephant were grown probably is four or five times of, of my size. And, but today he's so, so small and so vulnerable uh, in there. And, uh, and I, um, you know, I have to tell you the story that uh, that elephant didn't survive six months after we visited there. Didn't survive because he, he lost his mom by the poacher. And um, the conservation uh, officer find him uh, with a walk around by his mom's carcass there. I, animal just like human. <clears throat> when, when, when the baby saw them, what happened to the mom, they have the... Uh, uh, trauma. Uh, trauma, yeah. they have the trauma. So um, they refuse to help, they refuse to eat. Sometimes it's hard to you know, get into him. He's, he's a terrified. And uh, those, uh, I mean, conservation server, uh, service, uh, it's really hard to you know, take care of them. Even they, they spent so many time and some, so many manpower trying to raise him, but he didn't survive after six months. Well, you know what's interesting is basketball is giving you this great platform uh, to be an, an outspoken uh, advocate, if you will, on this issue. So let me ask you a little about basketball. The NBA, I mean, you, as I said, you were a bridge between cultures and countries, huge star here in the United States and China. Why do you think that is? Why do you think you resonated? Um, First of all, it must be because of basketball. This sports, and uh, this sports is so much fun and uh, uh, give me so many, uh, so much of a joy and being loved by uh, two sides of the people, you know, China and the U.S. And uh, without basketball, I won't, of course, I won't be uh, recognized by any of them. 
that that is number one. And, and then beyond that, I think um, through the sports and people uh, understand each other because what we do on the court and off the court, uh, we'll let people recognize what is our personality looks like. When we make a decision on the court and off the court, people know how what, what kind of people you are. And that that is the you know the bridge between people's to people's heart. Uh, globally, though, the NBA is just on fire. I mean, it's huge, not just here in the United States, around the world. A lot of sports, obviously, would love to be in the place that the NBA is. Why do you think it's, it's had this global footprint that perhaps other major sports have not? I think, first of all, basketball is a worldwide sport already uh, since uh, uh, Dr. Smith developed that sports in Indianapolis. Uh, Indianapolis in, uh, Indiana in um, uh, 1894, I believe. I, I think that, that sport is so easy to learn and a very minimal uh, uh, a number of people and also the place to the crowds. And everybody can play. And you can play from one-on-one, -on -one, two on two, or you just play by with yourself. And you, you can see a basketball court from here in the States or, or Canada or South America or a any Asia. In the, at minimum, any school, I visit a lot of schools in China. Some of the schools are in an underdeveloped area, but at a, at a very basic, they will have a basketball court there. You know, it's every corner in the world. I have to ask one final question, because uh, you're a rarity in the sense that you played the game, and now you're also an owner of a basketball team. Do you think that gives you a different perspective than most basketball owners? Uh, very, yeah. Um, I'm very new for this, and I think uh, basketball experience helped a little bit, but on the other hand side, sometimes will uh, give me trouble because uh, uh, you really want everybody to be like you, but you have to realize everybody have their pers uh, you know, individual personality. That you, can't, uh, you can't just uh, cookie canner everybody. Right, right. Yao Ming, thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate it. Coming up next, extraordinary athletes, dazzling fans with their basketball artistry on the court and their acts of goodwill off it.